Uh, Will and Kale. I'm just going to make you know most of the folks on the, on the panel, uh, Steve Culler uh, and Simpson Badger now. That's a new development. Congratulations, Steve. Welcome back. Thank you. Uh, Maylen uh, Quanget from uh, Citigroup. Uh, Kristen Donahue, thank you for coming from the CF. Oh, wait, we called it the CFPB, and I think we're not supposed to call it that. The BCFP. Um, uh, thank you for being here. Uh, Jesse Pinuccio from the JOD. text 
and to hew to established interpretations of the laws that we enforce. Um, so what that has meant as a practical matter um, is that we really have, uh, we continue to look at unfair, deceptive, and abuses, abusive acts and practices, and we are paying particular attention to the longstanding precedents that exist that uh, courts have, uh, where courts have offered interpretations of those standards. Uh, and we are looking at the facts and circumstances of each case and really applying those established standards. Um, the other thing I would say that Acting Director Mulvaney has instructed us is that he really wants us to strengthen our coordination with other agencies, uh, particularly when we have concurrent and overlapping jurisdiction. He's very focused on minimizing unnecessary and duplicative regulatory burden, uh, and so has asked us to make sure that we cooperate and coordinate with other leaders wherever possible. This is terrific. Uh, at least it sounds really terrific. Um, Rich, um, are you going to be a skunk at the party, or uh, is it end with this program? Uh, no, I think you know, we, uh, the Banking Agency Standards Bureau did put out uh, a statement on uh, the role of guidance that I think reiterated what basically is the basic principle, which is guidance which is not adopted pursuant to formal rulemaking procedures is not, cannot be the subject of enforcement action only in the underlying statute or a regulation. And I think uh, you know, we intend to follow that. Uh, I think the statement also made clear that the regulators will, in the future, try to avoid situations where Guidance which had an issue with uh, without notice and comment uh, would not have numerical thresholds uh, to try to avoid the impression that those numerical thresholds were out of themselves binding legal requirements. We also said that we would put out guidance, even though it's guidance, uh, for comment, and we didn't expect that, that would turn it into a legally binding rule. So I think that's sort of where we are. Um, why don't you turn to mainland next and just ask about you know, what you're seeing at a practical level in-house and is, is this helpful for you or not helpful for you to have guidance that isn't necessarily going to be enforced um, but is still guidance? Um, what, what's your perspective on this? Well, of course I think it's very helpful. Um, I, I have to say that I think the actual laws and statutes and regulations are sufficiently broad that you know, the, the guidance ne didn't necessarily affect um, us so stringently. I, I do feel like things aren't quite as bad as they were, but we still feel very much under the knife shield. And interestingly, I feel that the trend overseas is going the other way. So for those of us who operate in multiple jurisdictions, foreign regulators, I think, are referring matters to enforcement more often than they ever did. So to the extent that there's any void left by U.S. regulators not pushing the envelope as much as perhaps they used to, I think other countries are more than willing to step into the breach. So we still feel very much under the microscope from very many perspectives. What about you, Steve, of now that you're in, back in private practice, what are, what are you seeing? I mean, you've seen positive uh, implications flowing from uh, these changes or is it uh, lagging? Um, I guess I too think that these are positive developments that um, I, I think there's just sort of a carefulness, if you will, on the part of regulators when they're thinking and, and the Justice Department as they're thinking about enforcement actions that's, um, I think, constructive. Um, uh, so may, maybe a little less reflexive activity and, and a little bit more cerebral activity, that's, I think, what you want when you're across the table from, from an enforcer. Um, but I, you know, I, I would say that a lot of this is around the edges. Um, and just to come back to guidance, I mean, I, you know, one of the things that, that Kristen said sort of intrigued me, you know, when you take something like UDAP and, you know, you're thinking about, uh, you know, focusing on longstanding precedent or what you know, judges have said, this is, this is what it means. That's a tough thing to do when you're dealing with something that's new. So you've got you know, the abusive prong of UDAP. I don't think there have been a lot of courts that have opined. I don't think you have a long history of precedent. 
Um, and it may be in the category of be careful what you wish for, you know, some guidance from a regulator as to what they think that statute means is, is actually a good thing, not a bad thing. I'll just say a couple of things in response to that. <clears throat> um, so you're absolutely right, uh, you know, on fairness and deception um, as standards that are in Section 5 of the FTC Act and appear elsewhere have a much longer history of judicial interpretation than the abuse of the standard in Dodd-Frank. Uh, there are a few places we look for uh, the Dodd-Frank abuse of the standard. Number one is the statute itself, which sets forth a relatively detailed description of um, the abuse of the standard itself. We have had seven cases um, where we have alleged abusiveness. The defendant has filed a motion to dismiss and a court has ruled on the motion to dismiss. Um, the Bureau has prevailed in each of those seven cases and in each case the court found that the allegations stated by the Bureau in the complaint did state a claim for, unfair, uh, for abusiveness. Um, so that provides some guidance in terms of courts affirming the way the Bureau has been thinking about applying that standard to facts and circumstances. Um, and I'd also point to the Bureau's unified agenda, um, which was just released uh, several weeks ago and indicates uh, that the Bureau is considering taking up uh, a rulemaking pertaining to the use of the standard. That's very helpful. And Reg, can I just say one thing about that? Sure. I think you're right that uh, for new laws or new market situations, uh, having an understanding of how a regulatory agency might uh, enforce is helpful. And regulatory agencies can still do that. They should just do it through notice and comment rulemaking so that there's actually an opportunity for the regulated parties to have input and say, no, that's not what that should mean. And here's the reality. And that's the whole purpose of the APA, is that you get better decision making rather than these, uh, what essentially become. Because if an agency puts out guidance that hasn't gone through that process, effectively the market is going to react and conduct itself accordingly. And it hasn't gone through the process that is set up in statute to allow for proper input. So I think we can still have that, but follow the, the APA process that are set up for, for input. So I, I just checked my Twitter account, and um, Rod Rothstein is still the Deputy Attorney General. Um, and um, so I feel comfortable asking about uh, his uh, new piling on uh, policy, which encourages coordination among the DOJ departments. and other agencies to avoid multiple penalties for the same uh, conduct. That's been sort of the bane of, uh, of, of, of a lot of uh, companies for a long time. And I was hoping, Jesse, you could maybe tell us about the aims and implementation of the policy and how you're approaching things like credit for fines that are not paid to other agencies. Well, thanks, Rich. I think it is an important policy. And the basics here are, uh, you know, what is, uh, concept of fair play, what is appropriate enforcement, and are, are you having double enforcement for the same violation? So the goal here with Piling On is to say uh, that we have coordination uh, among, uh, in DOJ, among divisions and, and various uh, uh, enforcement sections there, but also with other <laughs> regulators. Uh, and so that if one section of DOJ is going to enforce under a certain law and uh, attract penalty appropriately, that uh, the same conduct is uh, punished doubly some other enforcement authority. And I think we're seeing that play out. Uh, for example, in the uh, June of this year, we announced our settlement with uh, Societe Generale uh, the, in Paris for FCPA violations, uh, and that was handled uh, by the department's criminal division, uh, but we also uh, dealt with other enforcers and made sure we gave credit. So the idea really is to make sure that you're having coordination among the enforcers and then apportionment uh, of the penalties so you understand uh, where the penalties are being assessed and, and that they're not double penalties, essentially. I'll jump to you, Rich, on um, this one. Um, in June, the federal banking agencies issued a policy statement on coordination of enforcement actions. Can you speak uh, to that, and is it in alignment with uh, the DOJ's position? Well, um, so actually, the, that policy statement just replaced an old FFIEC policy from the 90s about when the agencies, the banking agencies, would notify each other uh, on when they're going to take an enforcement action. So it was an updated policy. It's been replaced. The, the new policy deals almost exclusively with notification. All the agencies are going to notify each other of potential. It's designed to facilitate uh, cooperation, and I think uh, the banking agencies generally 
cooperate anyway when one banking agency is bringing an action that's not fed against a holding company and there's a national bank involved and some of the conduct overlapping, we would, as a matter of course, uh, coordinate with the OCC on that. So I think the, the policy generally is designed to improve the infrastructure for notification, but it's really just recognizing what already is the situation among the banking agencies, but it was just a policy for the banking agencies didn't deal with the broader issues of how uh, the agencies, when they're working with criminal and other uh, civil law enforcement agencies, will resolve it. So our practice has been we do bring uh, actions where it's appropriate, uh, parallel with other uh, law enforcement agencies. We try to the best we can <coughs> to coordinate with those agencies when we come to uh, a resolution. We disclose what the other agencies are doing uh, to our board members when they're deciding how to take a, an enforcement action. Uh, you know, that said, we're certainly aware of the new policy that the Justice Department uh, has uh, undertaken, and you know, we're always trying to look for ways in which we can improve our enforcement policies. Mick Kalen and, and Steve, um, are you seeing this cooperation? In fact, I get to tell you, I still see really eye-popping numbers. Uh, in these press releases, um, and um, I just wonder if on the ground you're, 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 you're seeing um, coordination and uh, credit. Uh, yes, yeah. so, so your question about the numbers is a good one. I will say we are seeing more coordination, but frankly I'm not sure that notification and awareness were really the issue. It is great to see, for example, the Society of General Resolution, which involved five different regulators, and so you know, just looking at it from the outside, it's very good to have all five announced on one day rather than having five different you know, investigations and resolutions spread out over many months or years. What we don't know, you know, we know that the fines that were levied in that case varied from you know, 54 million to 717 million. What we don't know is whether the total amount of fines is you know, lower than it would have been had these been spread out over many months or whether the total number ended up being the same. So one thing that is very difficult for us to discern is whether the increased coordination that is happening now is actually uh, resulting in the agencies giving uh, entities credit for fines or remediation they may be conducting uh, in response to another agency. Christian. That part is very difficult to see, and even in the Societe Generale resolution, um, you know, you, you can't tell. Some agencies, the SEC is sort of notable with that in their resolutions, will often say, and we have not issued a penalty because they've already fined by the DOJ or something. It would be very nice to see more of that and for us to understand exactly how credit is being awarded when you have multiple regulators involved. Steve, you want to jump in? Yeah, sure. A couple things. I mean, one, I think it's telling that, uh, you know, the, the, the policy statement that replaced the FFIC guidance of old um, didn't speak to the substance of what that coordination would do. You know, it just essentially said uh, uh, the regulators ought to be aware of each other and ought to be coordinating without saying how and what that coordination would look like. And, and frankly, I think that's disappointing. Uh, and I'm not sure that uh, in real life, um, the problem has been, boy, you know, one banking regulator didn't know what another was doing. Uh, that's much less the problem than, you know, each was levying its own penalty without regard to the other. Indeed, a couple of years ago on this very panel, a representative of, of the OCC said, we're precluded, we're statutorily precluded from taking into account what another regulator is doing in levying a sanction. Um, whether that was right or wrong, and I think it was wrong uh, as a statutory matter, uh, it was instructive because that was clearly the mindset of that banking regulator, and I suspect of, of the collective of banking regulators. Um, it's, I, you know, my sense is that that too has gotten better, um, but it's not going to get it, it's not going to get completely better if. Uh, people may have seen uh, a few weeks ago there was a piece in the New York Times that um, 
uh, analyze DOJ cases and SEC cases and uh, criticize the SEC for their total penalty amounts because they reflected also penalty credit that had been given in connection with uh, settlements that respondents had entered into with other agencies. So if the SEC said your penalty is 100 million, but we're going to deem you to have paid 70 by virtue of your settlement with the, with the Department of Justice, the Times said, we're only giving you credit for 30. That's the wrong way to look at it. And I think, uh, you know, as long as critics out there are saying, boy, you as an agency don't get credit for stuff that you don't collect for your coffers, uh, we're never going to get to the place that we should be. And, and the place we should be is, what would the total fine be if all of the agencies were appearing in a consolidated forum before one judge. And that's still not how the agencies look at this. And while it's getting better, we haven't, we haven't gotten there yet. Christian, I want to give you a chance to defend the, the agencies um, in a second. But I, it's interesting that Steve raised in the New York Times uh, article, which they called an expose, uh, comparing enforcement during the first 20 months under President Trump and the uh, last 20 months of President um, Obama. And according to the article, there was a 72% drop off in corporate penalties assessed by the department between the two time periods, much of which fell uh, in the FIREA and uh, uh, False Claims Act enforcement space. And there was a lot of pushback from SEC officials in the article, but uh, they didn't really say very much. And so I wanted to give Jesse a chance first to respond uh, to that, that article. Are, are you slacking off? <laughs> Would it surprise you if I said I thought the New York Times was in error? Uh, we did, we did in fact uh, push back. They just didn't print it. Um, so you know, it's not clear what methodology they used to calculate this. Uh, in their article, they said they had uh, uh, somebody at a New York law firm uh, pull some pull our press releases and add it up. So we tried to even pull sub, you know, uh, selections of our press releases to see if we could get their number, and we couldn't do it. They were off by about a factor of two, and we told them that. Uh, so I think they said uh, we had less than, in the first 20 months, less than $8 billion of FIRE recoveries. Um, they were wrong about that. In, in just the last year, we had $10 billion of FIRE recoveries. And, and so, like I said, over the 20-month over the period, they were off by about a factor of two. Uh, on our numbers and looking at it, uh, our, our FIREA penalties uh, and FCA penalties are fairly consistent with what they have been over time at DOJ. Uh, the main difference between the last administration and this one, the only main difference I can really tell is that uh, the last administration made a feature of their FIREA settlements, third party payments, uh, what they call consumer relief. Uh, and Attorney General Sessions issued a memo early on saying the DOJ would no longer be in business with third party payments because uh, they, raised, they raised a number of policy and legal problems, including uh, and runs around the appropriations process. So uh, that is one difference. But in terms of, uh, you know, main, uh, you know, the, the actual fire rate penalties and FCA penalties, we think it's fairly consistent. Christian, uh, we're in New York, so I can use Hamilton references as well. You're in the room where it happens. So um, what is actually going on with the regulators uh, now? Are you standing down, deferring each other, portioning? Sure. I'll, I'll make a few points in, in uh, response to that. Uh, first of all, as I mentioned at the beginning, uh, Acting Director Mulvaney has been very focused on our coordination with other regulators. Um, that being said, you know, I would say for the entire time that I've been at the Bureau, when it comes to assessing penalties in cases where there are other regulators involved, uh, what the other regulators are doing in terms of a penalty is always part of the conversation. Uh, there's not a time uh, where that's not something we advise the director on when we are uh, advising the director on what we think is the appropriate penalty in a given case. And it is absolutely a factor uh, that is considered along with all of the other factors. Um, so I, I think we and other regulators do strive to coordinate. Um, I, I will point to an example of coordination that the Bureau engaged in recently. Uh, that was somewhat unique, which is in uh, a, a case we brought against Wells Fargo this spring. Uh, the Bureau assessed a penalty against Wells Fargo, and we 
uh, affirmatively and explicitly gave Wells Fargo credit for the amount of money they paid to the OCC in a penalty, sort of similar to what Steve was referencing with the SEC. I didn't realize that meant we wouldn't get credit for our penalty. <laughs> Um, but no, you know, we, in the past, um, we have not been as explicit about it in order as we were in the Wells Fargo case, but that's an example of the time uh, where Wells Fargo assessed the difference between the penalty assessed by the, or Wells Fargo paid the Bureau, the difference between the penalty assessed by the Bureau um, and that assessed by the OCC. Um, and I'll just end by noting, though, that all of these agencies do have their own authorities and their own laws that they enforce. Uh, and a number of them provide for different types of penalties, uh, different policies and procedures for assessing penalties, and we all have an obligation to follow the statutes that we are enforcing in terms of penalties. So it's a balancing act in terms of all of these different factors. Justice Brennan said, this is what we've always done. This is really no change. We're just putting it in writing for you all to see, um, which may, in fact, have been the case. But what was very interesting about it is I do think it had an effect on other regulators within the United States and other regulators overseas. So now we are seeing both within the US and globally, regulators who typically focused just on corporations or entities really taking care to also name individuals and their actions. And it's, it's so obvious because you can see in you know, matters that banks are involved in, a regular naming you know, four banks and then one or two executives from each and we are seeing that everywhere, not just in the United States, but in Asia, in Australia, in Latin America, and in Europe. Um, we would like to see a little more guidance on how those decisions get made. I'll point helpfully to the OCC's recent guidance that came out uh, to back up for a moment. So the Yates Memo came out in 2015. In 2016, the OCC came out with some additional policies and procedures about how they were levying civil money penalties. And in that, you could tell that they were starting to focus more on individuals because there was more about intent, more about recidivism, more about responsibility of individuals who have control over a particular area. Now, more recently, just you know, a few weeks ago, the OCC issued some guidance on how enforcement actions related to individuals will work there. And it's really more process and procedure, but it's very helpful to know that there is a process and procedure to set up consistent guidelines for how they're going to approach individuals. And I think it would be helpful if that sort of guidance also add a you know, contagion effect and we saw more, more and had a better understanding of how different regulators are focusing on that. But I do think there's a, um, I'll say a populist thirst worldwide to hold individuals accountable when they see problems and regulators are responding to that. Populist thirst. Uh, <laughs> boy, uh, in, in that made rich. Uh, the Fed letters of reprimand issued to the directors of Wells Fargo attracted significant attention this year. What was the message that the Fed was looking to send through the public release of uh, those letters? Well, uh, so those were letters that were sent to uh, the existing board members of Wells Fargo at the same time that we took action against the company for essentially lack of oversight and over their compliance programs related to sales practices at the subsidiary bank. We also sent letters to the former lead independent director and the former chairman of the board, who was also a former CEO. The letters criticized their oversight over the compliance and risk management at the bank. I think the decision to issue those letters was dependent on the particular facts involved in that particular case. And uh, I think whether we will use those tools again, which we, it was the first time that we had used <coughs> like that uh, in, in, in the Fed's experience, uh, whether we use them again, uh, I will depend on the circumstances but we, uh, as a general matter, we do uh, have a high priority on bringing action against individuals as one way to maximize the current effect of enforcement actions. I think um, just looking at the numbers, we probably have done more individual actions in the last year than, than in recent memory. So the, the standards are under the banking laws for prohibiting someone from removing them from their office and into the bank are very high. Uh, negligence and bad judgment don't uh, meet the standards. You have to show some additional bad conduct, 
actually have to write that account up, and uh, those are the same thing that you have to uh, help pay our charge to our priority to get credit. Steve, you do a lot of work with boards of directors. Um, what was the perception uh, from other companies and any other observations you would to make? Yeah, I mean, in terms of perception, I mean, I, I, I think the message was received loudly and clearly that um, you know, board oversight is incredibly important, indeed critical, um, to the um, sound operation and safety and soundness of a financial institution. I, I would say, and I would ask Rich, I mean, I, sometimes I fancy myself a civil rights lawyer. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> what, what are we to think about due process when, when a government agency issues and publicly releases a letter that's critical of somebody without that person ever having a chance to get somebody with a black robe to say this happened or it didn't happen or it's right or it's not right. So I think the letters of, in and of themselves did not impose any legally enforceable sanction. Got that. They were, they were just statements about the uh, conclusions of the <coughs> investigation. I, I, so I, I, I that's just not, I just don't think that works. I mean, from a due process perspective. I, I don't think a government agency's public criticism of directors ought to happen without due process protections. And I know we're not talking about sending them to jail, we're not talking about sanctions, but boy, that's reputationally really harmful. And as a matter of fairness, as a matter of process, there ought to be a process. And I suspect, although you can tell us that it's different, that those directors never had an opportunity to review that letter and say, here's why you're wrong. Well, I don't think I can comment on the particular case, but just speaking generally, I think in a lot of these cases there is informal discussions uh, going on between the institutions about the particular conduct involved. Jesse, you got a civil rights division and um, you um, um, have been actually talking about unifying guidance that's coming from lots of various films with different people's names on them, um, getting them all into the U.S. Attorney's Manual. Can you tell me why you're doing that and, and uh, you know, kind of what kind of progress you're making so far? Yeah, uh, so the, for those who don't know, the internal policies of the department have long been collected, or some of them, uh, it's something called the USAM or the U.S. Attorney's Manual. This was really, uh, you know, some of it was just basic instructions. If you have an environmental case or a civil rights case or anything else, how do you prosecute it? Uh, you know, what are some of our, our basic procedures? But we also had things like the Yates Memo and the Brand Memo and all these named memos out there. And, and you know, for me, when we first came into the associate's office, we, we would, sometimes people would cite, you know, the Delray Memo or this or that. And I said, where are these memos? Uh, you know, and how many are out there uh, governing things? And so the Deputy Attorney General uh, started a project early on that involved uh, hundreds of people throughout the department to collect everything, all of the internal policies and procedures of the department uh, into the UCM, rename it the Justice Manual. It will apply department-wide. It's not just for U.S. attorneys. Uh, and, and not really have named memos anymore. But it, if anything does come out as a memo, it is quickly converted into Justice Manual provisions. So uh, that is going well. The, the, the rewrite uh, was done and, and uh, unveiled uh, I think a couple of months ago now. And of course, uh, as we continue to look at certain issues, uh, there will be updates to it. But I think it's a good and important project and we've made a lot of progress on it. Great. Uh, cooperation credit. Uh, Steve, we'll start with you on the side The banking agency at the time provided uh, guidance on corporate cooperation that you know, seems to be Times. Um, and even within DOJ, different divisions, uh, antitrust, criminal fraud, and provide guidance on cooperation that may be seen as conflicting by me. Can you talk about that, that issue and um, you know, what your clients are, are facing when they're trying to interpret the guidance? I mean, first of all, 
Well, I guess I would say in terms of cooperation with banking regulators, um, I mean, you don't have a choice but to cooperate. And I don't think of it as getting cooperation credit as much as if you don't cooperate, you're just going to get hammered. Um, and, you know, that, it's just, it's a different animal when you're dealing with, uh, you know, your primary regulators uh, to say, you know, somehow I should get rewarded for what I think is expected. Um, you know, when it comes to other agencies, when it comes to the Department of Justice and when it, when it comes to um, the SEC and the like, I think the challenge is, um, you know, how do you cooperate with one and ensure that you're not going to get sort of on the wrong side of another. Uh, and in particular, you know, if you think about things like, you know, uh, the antitrust, depart uh, antitrust division's amnesty policy and how that works vis-a-vis -vis the fraud section. And, you know, if you run in and say, you know, here's an issue, we'd like amnesty from the antitrust division, and, you know, you're going to parallel yourself with another part of the same uh, department, uh, you know, that, 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 I think, creates a conundrum. And I think the same is true, uh, you know, when you're, when you're talking across agencies that just have different policies on, you know, how <coughs> cooperation should work and how you're going to be rewarded for it. So that's the challenge. Just you all have taken on a lot of challenges so far. I think people are very appreciative of the way you've been thoughtfully listening to some of the criticism. Um, do you have any kind of response to, uh, to, to this particular criticism? Uh, yeah, I mean, I can say generally, I think this, I go back to my answer on the piling on policy. You know, the, the Deputy Attorney General has made clear uh, that he wants to make that a priority. Uh, that coordination and apportionment are important, and I think this falls within that bucket. And so uh, I'm aware of some of the criticisms, and we're aware of some of the criticisms in the past uh, about, you know, perceived lack of coordination with some of these. Uh, leniency policies, and so I think it's something we're we're looking at, uh, we're willing to take input on, and I think it's part of our overall effort to make sure that uh, we are appropriately applying a, a piling on policy uh, that we look at these issues when when they come forward. So uh, I think that's about as much as I can say on that right now. Fair enough, appreciate it. Um, take one more uh, issue and um, and then kind of open it uh, up, and that is uh, the issue of. Uh, client uh, privilege. Um, in May of this year, seven of the major law firms, including Steve Doors and, and ours, um, uh, authored a memo arguing that the banking regulator's examination authority does not override the attorney client privilege. Um, and I was wondering if um, uh, we could get some reaction uh, to that memo from Rich um, and maybe Kristen, uh, but also to get um, some sense of kind of the concrete changes that, uh, that you'd like to see from the banking regulators on this front. Well, I guess I can address that first. So, um, at least from the Fed's point of view, how attorney client uh, privilege apply really sort of depends on circumstances. Uh, has been pointed out, uh, the Fed has said publicly that we believe that the statutory authority to examine institution permits the regulators to have access to all information on the premises of the institution that is directly related to the safety and soundness of the institution, including privileged material. Now, we recognize that that is not universally accepted, and uh, that we never had an occasion where that argument has had to be tested. The second area where attorney client privilege comes up is when we're conducting law enforcement type investigations where the potential for an enforcement action at the end is there. There, I think we take the position that while we may ask for attorney client privilege uh, information, uh, in many cases, uh, we ask institutions to provide uh, notes of uh, witness interviews or statements that they've taken in the course of an internal investigation. If the institution search privilege in that circumstance, then uh, we would not try to claim exam authority to try and get that information. We would follow the normal subpoena enforcement process if we thought that we were entitled to the information. And I don't think, in, at least in my recollection, that we ever recommended to our board that the board impose some adverse consequences on an institution just because they asserted the internal <laughs> 
Christian, there was a, a, a public uh, comment period on the, the Bureau's uh, um, policies related to enforcement and CIDs. Um, you know, mainland, you probably know in the city media, how many days to go through this massive document and get a response in and raise all of our objections and the like. I think um, we need an extension. Uh, <laughs> fair enough. Uh, can you talk about uh, plans maybe in the works to implement uh, policy changes in this area? Sure. Um, I, I will describe briefly what the initiative is for folks in the audience who may not be familiar with it. Um, so when the acting director joined us at the Bureau, he launched <clears throat> what he referred to as a call for evidence, um, which is an initiative designed to solicit feedback on a whole variety of Bureau functions, enforcement being one of them. We issued a series of 12 RFIs, uh, and they were all generally aimed at gathering information about the efficiency and effectiveness of our work. They were all open for comment, I think it was for 90 days, although I, I do think there were some extensions granted um, when requested. Um, and all interested parties were encouraged to submit feedback. Uh, in the enforcement arena, uh, we solicited feedback on three specific topics. One was our CIDs, our use of CIDs. And the second was our administrative adjudication proceeding. And the third was our enforcement processes more generally. So the 12 RFIs closed in July of 2018. Um, we have nearly 90,000 comments uh, that staff at the Bureau are currently sifting through and organizing. And those comments are actually available online. They're publicly available at regulations.gov to the extent people are interested in taking a look. Uh, in addition to those comments, the Bureau hosted three roundtables. Uh, with industry stakeholders and with consumer stakeholders where we solicited additional feedback on all of that same information. Um, and so in terms of where things are right now, the responses are being collected, gathered, analyzed, uh, and I expect that uh, decisions about how to proceed in response to the feedback uh, will likely be part of what a new director thinks about it, if it is in fact the case that we have a new director. Okay, I was going to ask you the news on that part. I, I do not have news. Um, I, I know what others have read in the paper in terms of potential timing for a full Senate vote. Um, Kathy Craninger has been nominated to be director of the Bureau. She was voted out of the Senate Banking Committee a number of months ago. Uh, and the rumors I see in the papers are that she might have a vote from the full Senate very soon, but I don't know anything firm about that. Terrific. Rich, why don't we give you a chance to make some news as well? Can you tell us <laughs> something that nobody else knows about uh, what we can expect from the Fed uh, priorities in 2019? Uh, well, uh, we have had a uh, significant change in board membership in the last year or so. Uh, Jay Powell moved from member to chairman. We Vice Chairman for Supervision has been on the job for uh, a year or so now. Um, just last Monday, uh, our first board member with experience in community banking was sworn in as a board member. Uh, I think when you just look at uh, what we have done in the past year or so, uh, there doesn't seem to be any dramatic change in the kinds of cases that we're bringing. We're still in appropriate cases bringing uh, parallel actions with law enforcement and uh, other civil enforcement agencies. We're continuing to target individual bankers where we, we can make a case. We have brought cases uh, to enforce consumer protection laws. And so, at least for now, uh, we expect that can, to continue. Of course, as new members join uh, our board and become acclimated, <coughs> that could all change. But right now, I think we're basically doing what we have been doing. Jesse, I, I checked again, and uh, Rob Rosenstein still the deputy attorney general. Uh, um, but I can make all you want. Um, uh, uh, Rod is very different, so I, I feel comfortable saying this. But uh, one of the challenges that the DOJ has been over the last year and a half not knowing who to go see on um, the issues. And part of that was because the confirmation process has dragged on for a really long time for a number of slots. You've now got people in, I think, almost all of the slots. Um, you know, we saw um, you know, the head of the criminal division announce the end to the monitor industrial complex um, and some other things. And so policy seems to be getting made. Um, but 
I suspect people in the room would appreciate understanding how you all think about escalation and you know who one ought to go see when you see problems or issues, policy um, or, or case specific uh, issues. Can you to say about that? Yeah, let me say two things. One, I would just say, you know, I saw some articles that uh, uh, over time, over the last few years, uh, I thought were rather humorous because they said things like, um, well, you know, a lot of people haven't even been confirmed, so there must be nobody in the building doing anything. Uh, you know, I happen to think Atkins uh, can do the job. But we're, we're in a world, uh, uh, you know, confirmations take a long time. This isn't unique to this administration at this point. It, it's a modern trend in Congress and with the executive branch. And so we're in a world in which uh, deputy officials and, uh, step up and take acting roles. And sometimes they're in the, for a long period of time. Uh, and I think, you know, from the outside, you should just follow that overcharge and realize that those people are there and they're empowered to do the job, and they are doing the job. And we saw that in the divisions, for example. I'll just take environmental uh, as one example. Uh, the acting assistant attorney general was Jeff Wood. He did a phenomenal job for 21 months, and now Jeff Clark is there, and he's off to a great start. But it wasn't as if we lacked for uh, policy being made in that division or important cases going forward or proper meetings being had. Uh, in terms of escalation, you know, I can give you my own view, which is uh, if it's an issue that uh, appears to already be on the radar of one of the leadership offices as something we've identified as a priority and are working on, it may be appropriate to start there. Although uh, the preference usually is, you know, if we are a law enforcement organization in the end, and, and we are somewhat hierarchical, and so we like to escalate things in the proper order to give the frontline folks a chance to resolve them. Uh, that's their job. Uh, and then after that, the leadership of the division and the assistant attorney general. And then if, you know, if there's still an appeal to be had, we think it's an issue of cross-cutting policy that either the associate's office or the deputy's office, or in some instances, even the office of the attorney general are interested in, you know, that escalation may be appropriate. But uh, when I get calls in the first instance on something I've never heard of, I, I typically say, well, you know, have you actually talked to anyone in the civil division yet beyond the, the frontline attorneys? Have you talked to the assistant attorney general? If the answer is no, I usually say, can you start with the head of the civil division so I can have his informed views before, before I make a decision? Great. Um, so we have a few minutes uh, for questions, and so I'll open it up to the, uh, the audience. Yes? Uh, sorry. in uh, the department's approach to guidance documents uh, where you're now giving uh, industry uh, you know, an opportunity to comment and advance notice and how that might relate to the way the department has previously used a FIREA or other new or old statutes to which they're giving uh, sort of new interpretations. And just to explain a little further, FIREA came out in the 80s in response to the saving the loan crisis. Then it was used uh, for the small level mortgage fraud cases. And then, as uh, Stephen knows, was then brought up and used in RMBS cases and the, the self affecting theory, which had never been used before. I think Jesse, Jesse may know a little bit about this. Yes, Jesse, Jesse yeah. as well. Great. Uh, but is this the kind of thing that you would like to have seen advanced notice uh, from the government saying this is how we intend to use this statute going forward? Or does it relate in any way to your guidance to approach to that about well, it's a good question, uh, and somewhat of a difficult one. Uh, and I have to start a little carefully because we have pending cases, uh, so I probably won't uh, talk too much about it. I guess I'd say this, uh, to speak more generally about the topic. Uh, it is certainly true that one way to get notice of uh, what an agency thinks about a statute is there's some guidance document, and we've talked about that already today, and, and our thoughts on that. Another is, you know, some people say, well, there's regulation by enforcement. And, and that can be an issue, although I'd also say this, uh, you know, new factual situations arise all the time, and you can have a good faith debate about whether those factual situations uh, fall within the plain text of the statute. Uh, and they can, even though those situations hadn't arisen before. If that weren't the case, uh, we basically wouldn't be able to use any statute in any new situation. And for example, uh, we see this, uh, you know, to take something completely different, in the opioid crisis right now. Uh, the Controlled Substances Act uh, hasn't always been used in that space because we haven't had that crisis before. But it doesn't mean that it was unforeseen that the act might apply to doctors and pharmacists and manufacturers that were doing things that if they had 
really taken account of what the act says, they would have known their conduct was, was out of bounds. And so I know that's not a perfect answer. It's a little difficult for me because I don't want to comment on the pending by rate cases. But I think there is a line there. Uh, but my personal view would be uh, uh, new conduct and new factual situations can be applied to the hard end of statutes just because they haven't been before. So last question, we'll go to uh, Greg Bear while I send it up to my opioid clients. <laughs> <laughs> You've heard me say all that before, right? Thank you.